So, first of all, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, oh, I forgot my laser pointer, slide thingy, whatever. That means I can walk around the stage without running back to my computer every bloody slide to advance the darn thing. In case anyone's curious, this is why I do what I do. That's my wife and daughter. So today, we're going to talk about how to fake a database design. Uh, it's a subject which, uh, for me, I'm particularly curious about because Part of what I've done is uh, I help companies, you know, evaluate potential developers. And one of the things I've noticed is developers suck when it comes to database design. They are really, really bad at this. And it's frustrating to me because we've known about the basics of normalization for uh, 40 years now. Why is it 40 years later we're still so bloody bad at designing databases? So <clears throat> one thing a lot of developers don't realize there, is that a little bit better? Am I breathing? Can you still hear me fine? Okay, cool. One of the things that a lot of developers don't realize, uh, and this, this is a key thing to understand, is if you know how to design a database, you're going to learn SQL because you have to put data into the database, take it back out, whatever. If you know SQL, that doesn't teach you anything about designing a database. And that's what a lot of developers don't understand. Knowing SQL doesn't teach you anything about database design, doesn't teach you anything about the relational theory. Unfortunately, those things that do teach you about the relational theory are rather complicated and get confusing. So good database schemas, this is stuff we talk about that, that they're normalized, whatever the heck that means. Uh, Denormalized only as necessary, that's really important. But I'm not even going to cover that right now because that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about. No duplicate data, that one is also extremely important. And then we start talking about things like removing redundancy, logical relations, atomic elements, which most people are like, what's an atomic element, you know? And that actually gets down a huge rabbit hole that I also will not be going into today. And I'm also only going to be covering this up to what we call third normal form, and I'm not even going to describe the normalization terms. Because what I want to do is try and get past this problem. So it is shown that if a relationship is in third normal form and every key is simple, then it is in projection normal form, sometimes called fifth normal form, the ultimate normal form with respect to projections and joins, and what the hell did that mean anyway? This is what happens when people decide they want to learn a little bit about databases, but they really don't get deep into the theory. So they get stuck with stuff like this and they don't understand what it means. So forget about all that. Uh, let's just go ahead and get started. This is not a tutorial on SQL. You'll learn SQL. This is just enough to give you some idea about how to design a database. Now, I'm going to be covering a fair amount of material here. So I want to say, you know, for our question policy, if you are asking a question to try and understand a little bit more about what I'm doing, trying to expand beyond what I'm doing, hold that question till the end. If you have a question because I, you didn't understand something I said, go ahead and hold your hand up because someone else will have that same question. Does that make sense? Cool. So number one thing <clears throat> about faking a database design is forget everything you know about Excel. I meet tons of people who give me databases which look pretty much like they've been dumped directly from a spreadsheet into a big fat table. I get lots and lots of candidates who do this when they're trying to get jobs through me. It's awful. We're going to be focusing on nouns, more or less. <clears throat> and I mentioned duplicate data earlier. Remember, duplicate data in a database is generally a design flaw. But identifying duplicate data can be a little bit tricky, and I'll get to that later. Um, and I do have one question, just out of curiosity for the audience. How many of you already know how to design a database, and you're just here to see if I'm an idiot? Oh, that's intimidating. <laughs> so some of you are going to be frustrated with some of what you see. This is not designed to teach you everything there is to know about normalization of databases. It is designed to make you better than the vast majority of developers out there. And if you take in everything that I teach you today, you will understand more than the vast majority of developers. By the way, go out to slideshare.net, Ovid. You'll see this linked a couple of times. You will not remember everything that I am teaching you in this. You might think you will, but once you hit a real database, you'll forget. So go out to slideshare.net, Ovid and download a copy of this the next time you have to hit a database design that'll help you remember some of this. So this, I think this was back in 2001. This is a real thing that happened. Client sent us 
uh, <clears throat> a problem they had. They wanted us to redesign their website. Uh, basically, they were a pears company. You could buy pears from them, and you could buy recipes for pears. I don't know why people would want to buy recipes for pears, but they, that's what they sold. So customers could order recipes. Very simple thing. They had an access database, and they had some problems with scalability. It wasn't working very well. And our DBA, I use this word in quotes, said that this was a good design for the recipes table. If you already know how to design a database, don't answer this. If you don't know how to design a database and you are here because you really want to understand the basics, can you tell me what's wrong with that? Yes, all the ingredients in one table. Why, why is this bad? Oh, yes you can, because ingredient eight was a CSV field. Now, that was, a question, that was a thing for those of you who don't know anything about database design. For those of you who do know database design, you're going to love the next slide. <laughs> so getting back to the plot. We had customers can order recipes. That's the basics of what we're trying to focus on for this particular problem we had. So I said nouns equal tables. That's yeah, sort of true. So we basically have three nouns that we're going to focus on. Customers, orders, uh, recipes. Those are our three tables. What are we going to have in those three tables? So what sort of data are we going to have? That's kind of fun. You guys go away. I'm having a good time here. Sorry. <laughs> Nobody gets my sense of humor. OK, <clears throat> to cover the sort of data that we have in here, I actually want to go right to left. We're going to start over here with recipes. So we have customer ID, order ID, and we have a recipe ID. Again, if you know how to design databases, you know that's a surrogate key. You know there's some questions about surrogate and natural keys. I'm not covering that. The vast majority of companies tend to use what we call surrogate keys, which is a non-identifying number, which is the record, which is the thing which identifies this particular thing in a table. I'm not going to go into that too much because this is what you commonly face. Again, this is not a perfect database class. This is better than most. So recipes, we have a name for the recipes, you know, chicken cordon bleu. We have directions on how to make chicken cordon bleu. Directions is a noun. Why doesn't that have a separate table? That's where it's kind of hazy and it requires some expert knowledge on your part to tease this out. The reality is directions is kind of a shorthand for the name of the recipe. If you get rid of the name and you simply describe to a chef how to prepare chicken cordon bleu, they're going to know that it's chicken cordon bleu. So it's simply an alternate name. If you had two recipes with the exact same set of directions, it's probably the same recipe. So in this case, directions is completely tied to the recipe ID. It, you shouldn't move that into another table in this basic sense because this is part of what a recipe is. Whereas over here, we have orders. We have a customer ID saying which customer placed a particular order, and we'll come back to that. And we have an order date. The order date, of course, is completely dependent on the order. So we don't move that noun into a separate table. Any noun which is completely wholly dependent on the noun describing the main table pretty much belongs in that table. Customers, we have the name, we have the address. Ah, this one's interesting. What if you have more than one customer with the same address? Or what if you want to have a mailing list where you can send out bulk mail to people, but you don't necessarily know what their name is? You've, you've all gotten mail like this saying, dear homeowner. In that case, tying address to the customer ID is bad. It's not wholly dependent on this necessarily. You can have multiple customers with the same address. You could one have one address, or one customer could have several addresses. One address could be for several customers. You might have addresses without customers. It is not the case that address wholly belongs to the customer's table. So that one shouldn't be there. It is such a common design flaw that I left it in here just to be able to explain why nouns don't always equal tables. So are you with me so far on the basics of that? Anyone have any questions? Didn't understand? Cool. So rule number one, nouns equal tables. Very simple. But what's with that customer ID thing that we have right here? Orders has a customer ID pointing to the customer's customer underscore ID. 
That's what we call a foreign key. One customer can have many orders. It's called a one-to-many relationship. I am mostly going to avoid jargon in this talk, but I will be focusing on the jargon you're going to hear all the time when you work with databases. So one customer can have many different orders. That's a one-to-many relationship, which means these orders belong to the customer, which means these orders have to have a customer ID identifying the customer. So we put what we call a foreign key constraint there. And the DDL, that's data definition language, is going to kind of look like this. So create table orders. If you're wondering, this is PostgreSQL syntax. I'm just showing this for inform information purposes. When you create the table, you define the foreign key customer's ID references customer's customer ID. By the way, if you know MySQL, PostgreSQL does not automatically create an index there. Just a little trivia note for those of you who are curious or who don't know that. So why would you put a foreign key on a table? Does anyone know what foreign keys do? Referential integrity, right. What does that mean? Yes, that is absolutely correct, Brian. You cannot insert an order into a table if you have a customer ID pointing to a customer which doesn't exist. It will blow up. It will protect your data's integrity. If you try and delete a customer which has orders attached, unless you have something called a cascade delete, which we won't talk about, it won't let you delete that customer because it says you still have orders and we don't want dangling order recipes. That's all a foreign key constraint is. It says, if you're going to insert this data, this data must be a real valid thing that is pointing to something which actually exists, so you don't get bad data. If you don't use foreign key constraints, you will eventually insert records or which are pointing to things which don't exist, or you will delete records that other things point to. Every system I have ever worked on which doesn't use foreign key constraints but has relations between tables, as they all do, has eventually been proven to be inconsistent. I get this all the time, and you don't want this, and this introduces bugs in your program when you try and select the customer for an order when the customer doesn't exist. So rule number two, another table's ID must have a foreign key constraint. Got to have that, very important. So this abomination of a table, uh, we're about to talk about what's called first normal form, by the way, forget about that term because you don't care. So we don't want ingredients one through eight. But let's imagine some sort of bizarre business constraint which said, yeah, it's, it's okay. You can never have more than eight ingredients for a recipe. I, why, why would we have a constraint like that? So we've got this strange cookbook which guarantees that every recipe in the cookbook is eight ingredients or fewer. So fettuccine is one of the most misspelled words in the English language. Uh, anyone want to call out the number of the correct spelling? Okay, well, obviously, let me know. It's definitely not number six, but I kind of like that one. <laughs> that says fetid cheney, in case you can't read that. Uh, so we got a few numbers called out. Um, if you have the ingredients listed multiple times, how do you select the recipes from your database which contain fettuccine, knowing that you might have misspelled it? <laughs> do you really want to do that? Okay, by the way, in case you're wondering, it's spelled like this, and anyone who called out a number was wrong. <laughs> so everyone gets the spelling wrong, and many people swear up and down when their previous spellings was right. So you, you, you want to avoid having this data duplicated in your database. So if you always spelled it correctly, here's one way you could write the SQL. You know, select recipe ID name from recipes where ingredient one equals fettuccine or ingredient two equals fettuccine. Or you could reverse that where you could say fettuccine in ingredient one, ingredient two, ingredient three, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of duplication there and you would like to avoid that. You don't want this mis you don't want to have this repeated all of the time in your data. So we have an ingredients table. Fettuccine goes into one and only one spot in your database and that goes in your ingredients table right down there. So if you have a list of things, it goes into its own table. A list, by the way, is zero, one, or more, where you don't know the number of those items up front, um, and they're not guaranteed to be fixed. That's, that gets a little complicated sometimes, because there are some exceptions to that. Uh, basically, list of things get their own table. But you need a lookup table between them, because one recipe can have many ingredients. One ingredient can be on many recipes. So you have the recipes, the ingredients, 
and you've got what we call a many-to-many -many relationship. So you actually put a table in between them to help look them up. And in this case, the table, it's called a many-to-many -many relationship, recipes, ingredients. We've got a recipe ingredient ID, which points to a recipe ID. Remember that second rule? Another table's key has to have a foreign key constraint. An ingredient ID, which points to the ingredients table, again, a foreign key constraint. And lookup just becomes this. We don't have any duplicate data. The SQL is just a little bit more complicated. But now, if you have misspelled fettuccine, you have one and only one spot to correct it, which is what you want. It means you correct it in that one spot, and every place that needs to read fettuccine now has the correct spelling for it. And just walking through the SQL, again, it's not an SQL tutorial, but just gives you a rough idea of how this works. So select recipe ID name from recipes. We join the recipe ingredients on our recipes table. We then join the ingredients on the recipe ingredients table where the ingredient name equals fettuccine. And that's how that works. Very simple, very straightforward. So do you have a rough sense? Uh, well, actually, let's look at the DDL for this first of all. Um, we generally have a unique constraint across the keys to ensure that you don't list like eggs 273 times for you know, fettuccine carbonara, because that would not make sense. Uh, if you're a cook, you might start having some questions at this point. There's a few things I'll cover later about how that works, but we're not getting into this too deeply. This is just a simplified example. Great, I got plenty of time. And of course, we have the foreign keys, recipe ID, ingredient ID. Uh, this recipe ingredient ID, this is a non-identifying ID. We call, we call it a surrogate key. Some people will do this for a lookup table. They'll just use the recipe ID and the ingredient ID and define that as a compound primary key. Again, this is not a tutorial on SQL. just gives you some things you can look at on the slides and slide share to think about how some of this is actually done. So rule number four, many-to-many -many relationships, it's a lookup table. And you have foreign key constraints against the other tables in order to make sure you're not inserting bogus data. So does many-to-many -many relationship kind of make sense to you folks now? Just to be sure, we're going to do it again. How do we order recipes? A customer can have many, <clears throat> so let me see, which one is this? Yes. So, Order recipes. An order can have many recipes on that order. When a customer orders, they might order recipe one, two, and three. But a recipe could be on many different orders. You don't want to just sell the recipe once. So again, we have a many-to-many -many relationship here. So we put this lookup table. Orders, recipes. We have the order ID pointing off to the order, recipe ID pointing off to recipes. And that allows you to have an order with many recipes on it. And a recipe can be on many different orders. That's, that's one of the more complicated things that people tend to screw up on quite a bit, understanding the difference between one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships in databases. Now, <clears throat> how many of which ingredient, though? That's something which I kind of touched on a little bit. I said you know, we had a unique constraint across the recipe and the ingredient, but what do we do if we have three eggs? Well, in this case, we have a measures table. The, measure might, the name might be a unit. And then in the recipe ingredients table, we have a quantity, so we could say three. So if recipe, if egg ID from the ingredients table is seven, and the unit ID from measures is 10, then whatever recipe ID, we'd have the ingredient ID of seven for the egg, the measure ID for the unit, and then we'd say three units. And that allows you to build up a list of ingredients for your recipe saying this many of this unit of this ingredient and then you have the directions on how to make that recipe. Does that make sense? So we actually had a very simple idea. We had customers, orders, and recipes. And it's already grown into seven tables. The reality is production database, it's going to get a lot larger. It's going to get a lot more complicated. But you can already see how this is beginning to get complicated now. But what it does is it allows you to ensure that none of your data is repeated. You don't cut and paste subroutines. Why would you cut and paste data? For the same, you avoid each for the same reasons, because you don't want them getting out of sync. <clears throat> so, so far, nouns tend to have their own tables. Lookup tables join related tables on many-to-many -many relationships. They generally have some sort of unique constraint on them to make sure you can't insert duplicate rows for that. And another table's IDs have foreign key constraints. And again, I put up the slide share net. 
thing because you need to download the presentation because lots of people will go through various tutorials and normalization and they think they know how to normalize something and they'll forget. So you're going to want to walk through this a few times. So I've covered, I've covered the big stuff. Uh, more or less how to design the tables in a database. Um, again, if you know it, you know there's a lot of sloppiness in there. But still, if you just follow that, you will produce databases far better than the vast majority of developers that I've assessed, and I've had to assess a lot of them. In fact, I've had developers who've, t I had one who taught database normalization at the university level, and he was inserting a bunch of duplicate data. And I asked him, why did you do that? And I said, well, um, I'm trying to optimize the performance of this database. You just read seven rows from a CSV file, and you're trying to optimize the performance on that? It, it is strange how people kind of break down the idea of this, one of the core fundamental things of their application, the thing that they cannot screw up on, but they get kind of sloppy about it. They don't pay attention to it. So now that you've covered the structure, we're going to go a little bit deeper, a few other things that we need to know about. This is the one which causes all sorts of subtle bugs. Just because two things are the same does not mean they're the same thing. If I meet another guy named Curtis, he's not me. He is not I, sorry. Um, but you, know, you would know that. You would take it for granted. Of course, two people named Curtis aren't the same person. Um, <clears throat> and this is something which actually impacts databases quite a bit. It impacts them when we start moving from the abstract to the concrete. And we'll see an example here. So we're selling recipes to customers online. How do you get the price of a recipe? Or how do you get the price of an order? Well, obviously, this is the price of all the items on the order. So do we store the total on the order? Well, no, we're actually not going to do that. Uh, are we going to store it on the recipe? Well, yes, but that's actually not enough. And we'll see why in just a moment. So over here, an order, let's say it has three recipes. And each recipe, we have a price on there, and each recipe is one euro. So the order total, then, you're going to sum all of that up. And you know, here's how we join across everything to, down to get to the item price. And so if, as I said, we had three recipes on there. Each of them cost a euro. So the order total is going to be three euro. Is that correct? Why not? Yes? You already know database design, don't you? You already know database design? OK, you're cheating. <laughs> well, yes, that, that's exactly what happens. The price of an item is the price of the item in the abstract. But what if the price changes? You might get a rebate. You might have a discount for something. You might have a birthday sale or whatever. So when you start moving data from kind of like an abstract thing to something concrete, like a customer order, that's the point where you want to start saying, even though these two values values look the same, they are not. So you actually put the price on the order recipes table. You copy it from this table to this table, because here it's gone from the abstract price of the recipe to the real price of what we're selling it at now for that particular order. And your SQL actually becomes simpler, because now you're just summing the price off the order item table up there. So, just because things look the same doesn't mean that they are. It doesn't mean identity. So again, price could change. You want to, someone comes up to the counter, they've got something which is bashed up, they want to buy it, but you give them a 50% discount. You can't do that unless you copy the price over to the order item table so you can record the price at the time that it's made. So when you're working with the database, remember, if you're moving something from kind of an abstract idea of this is what something should be to a concrete right now representation, particularly if you have records for which a timestamp is critically important, this is a good indicator that you need to copy some data over because it's not really the same even though it looks like it. So rule number five, watch for equal values that aren't identical. So that one's kind of tricky for some folks. Does that make sense though? Okay. <clears throat> Naming, this is a big one. Names are really important. You should pay a lot more attention to naming in a database. A database is your first line of defense against bad data. It's not your code. Correction, the database is last line of defense against bad data. A well-designed, properly normalized database actually can make it hard to insert bad data if you do it correctly. Particularly PostgreSQL, I love that because I can define my own data types, and it will throw exceptions if I insert stuff which doesn't match that type. 
there's, that's not the sort of flexibility you get with other databases, but it's a really powerful feature. A well-designed database, hard to insert bad data. But you want to take time with this database, a little bit more time than you would with your code, to make sure you're doing it right. So pay attention to your naming. A name should hint at the use. For example, in the United States, many people would never blink at this query. Can anyone see an issue with this? Yeah. She said yeah. Like it's wrong. I know this is <laughs> Shut up, Jeff. <laughs> so yeah, temperature. That, that, that doesn't tell us anything. Like if you want to take the average of temperatures and one happens to be Celsius, one happens to be Fahrenheit, you actually data types should have the operators defined between them and how the operators behave, but there's a lot of flexibility you cannot get in most relational databases today. Um, <clears throat> so name should hint at use, and this does not. It doesn't tell you anything because, again, to the American eye, that would look fine. But obviously, 32 degrees is not too cold. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Never happened. NASA said no. They've also had satellites blow up, but... So, yes, that, that's a good point. So here's another one. Uh, order ID versus, or, versus just ID. This is a mistake I used to make all the bloody time, and I defended it, and I was just flat out wrong. I was wrong. Uh, a lot of people use, just like to use ID as a shorthand because this is kind of duplicated here, except you're often not using the table name. So can anyone tell me what's wrong with this? There's a glaring error in that SQL. Yeah, you can spot it instantly if you called it recipe ID and compared that to order ID. A lot of people didn't spot it as soon as you did. Oh, sorry, I was, I was shining the laser pointer in your eyes. <laughs> That's very thoughtful of me. So a lot of people didn't spot that as soon as you did. Um, it's, a, it's a hard thing to see. And that was a very simple example of SQL you know that recipe ID and order ID should not be comparable because IDs tend to be non-identifying things when we use surrogate IDs. They're non-identifying things. There's no point in comparing them, but this kind of hides what you're actually comparing because we're using aliases to keep our, to not just keep our SQL shorter, but sometimes you have to join against the table several times and you have to alias it differently every time. So this, by spelling out the name, it makes it much easier. It's conceptually similar to this. You know, select name from customer where ID is greater than weight. That comparison doesn't make any sense. But this is the exact sort of thing that SQL allows, a lot of sloppiness in how you compare things. So you need to give the developer a chance to see easier in a single line of code that something is wrong. For example, this is what finally converted me, and I admit I was rather late to the game. It is really hard to walk through here and find an extremely glaring error, but it's an extremely glaring error if and only if you use table name underscore ID, and then it stands out immediately. It'll take you a while to walk through this and find out what the order is. Sorry, too late. <laughs> so name columns as descriptively as possible. Try and give a hint at their use. This will make it much, much easier <clears throat> for you to maintain your databases later on and not make silly mistakes. So what we have, so nouns more or less equal tables. Unless the noun belongs to another table and wholly, wholly belongs to that other noun, like directions belonging to the name of the recipe. Don't forget your foreign key constraints. Proper naming is very, very important. Your DBAs are really going to thank you about this because your databases won't be perfect, but they'll be much, much better than the vast majority of developers out there. When I am giving tests to developers to find out how well they know certain things, I meet expert developers who write beautiful code. They've got 10, 15 years of development experience under their belt, and they've been using databases the, almost the entire time, and they're always wrong. I mean, they're really, really fundamentally bad. The standard test I give requires a minimum of five tables in order to be normalized correctly. Almost every developer has three or fewer. Yes, fewer. <laughs> so your apps will be more robust as a result. So, oh, that slide should be in a different talk. Sorry, that's Perl. Oh, yeah, it's Perl conference, I can do that. 
before I take questions, <clears throat> we have a choice at this point. We can go with questions, because I'm sure a few of you folks have some questions, or we have some time, yay. How much time do we have left, by the way? 15 minutes, great. We have some time, I have some bonus slides. But these bonus slides are gonna make your head hurt a little bit. They're not gonna be easy ones, and I leave them there in case I don't have enough room for the rest of the talk. So do you wanna go with questions, or do you wanna go, do you wanna go with bonus slides? Okay. <clears throat> yes, Ray. No, I have 50 minutes for this talk. In fact, when I first gave it, I had 40 minutes for this talk. So, bonus slides. So, first of all, by the way, as an aside, if you want to be a speaker at a conference, but you are nervous about taking questions, some people are, what you do is at the beginning of the talk, you announce your question policy, which basically makes them hold all their questions to the end. And then at the end, you ask them, do you want questions or bonus slides? They will always take bonus slides. <laughs> <clears throat> and I warned you these were hard. I tried to dissuade you. <clears throat> okay, so this was some really important stuff that I thought you should know. I wasn't sure if I'd have time to fit it in. Avoid null values like the plague. Uh, this, <laughs> yes, some of you have designed databases, I can tell. But this is going a little bit deeper into database design theory, but basically uh, skipping some of the complicated terminology. Every column has a data type and a name. So we might have temperature Celsius as a column name. And this will describe the type of data, the kinds of data you can have in there. I like to avoid using the word type because it really gets overloaded. This tells you the kinds of data that you have in a particular column. And if you have a really good, powerful database, which allows you to find operators, it would say the kinds of data you have, the type of operations you can perform on them. Like an ID field should never be allowed to be compared except against another ID field of the same type of ID. And it shouldn't be allowed to have greater than, less than, et cetera. But what does a null value mean? A null value is, at its core, generally, when it's in a database, it means that it is unknown or it doesn't apply to this table. So the type doesn't apply. We don't have a type, so we don't really know what to do with the thing. If you have ever wondered in SQL, while you see things like where you know, person.name is null or person.name is not null, and you don't have like an equals or not equals sign in there, it's because null, we don't even know what the type is, so the standard operators don't mean anything. And if I had a chance, I would go back in time and change the SQL standard to rename null to unknown because it would really solve a lot of problems because people would understand that better, particularly people with dynamic language backgrounds. What does null mean? Oh, that means zero or the empty string, depending upon the context. No, it doesn't. Avoid nulls. <clears throat> so we have an employees table. We have an employee ID. We have a name. And we have a salary, which is a money data type. By the way, that's something specific to PostgreSQL. If you've ever worked with accounting systems, you know why you want that. <laughs> and it can be null. What does that mean? So <clears throat> you're going to give a $5,000 bonus to all employees. Sorry, I gave this talk in the US the first time. Only if they make more than $40,000 a year with the space between those two words. Oops. So select employee ID name from employee where salary is greater than $40,000. Uh, you just got fired because the CEO makes more than $40,000, but he didn't get his $5,000 bonus. He's really unhappy about that. So. The comparison operator that we had there, the greater than, that doesn't work against if salary is null because we don't know what type is in there. So we don't know what sort of operators we can apply to a null value. In fact, you can't even say if null equals null because these values are unknown and we don't know if this unknown value equals that unknown value. Which is again, why it's is null or is not null and not equals. So. <clears throat> That SQL won't return anything with a null salary. And why is it null? Um, it might be a confidential inf bit of information. If they're on a contractor and someone decided to put contractors in the employees table, stuff like that happens all the time, uh, then they might not have a salary. What if they're an unpaid intern? Ignore that, sorry, that was a little typo. Uh, <laughs> what if it's unknown when the data was entered? They're a brand new employee and we just haven't gotten their salary information yet. There's all sorts of reasons why this data can be unknown 
which could have all sorts of different effects on, you know, if they're an intern, then we know we're never going to give them the $5,000 bonus. If their salary is unknown because we just haven't received it yet, then they might receive the $5,000 bonus. So your business logic changes. That's why nulls start getting so complicated. Now it's going to hurt. Nulls tell you nothing. They lie to you. So I re highly recommend the book Database in Depth by CJ Date. Uh, it does require that you know something about database normalization, however. Um, so you've got a supplier's table. It has two columns, one record in there. You've got a supplier ID, S1, and you've got the city of London. Parts table, two columns, a part ID, P1, and a city, null. That means it's unknown. We don't know where this part is, we just know the part exists. If you can think of an easier example, I would be really impressed. So two tables, two columns in each table, one row in each table. So select part ID from parts. This is going to give you P1, right? Select part ID from parts where city equals city. What's that going to return? Why? But we know for a fact that we're pulling this from a single table and this city has to be equal to the city even if it's unknown because it's the same unknown. This is a known unknown in terms of Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> <laughs> he actually, I, I do not like Donald Rumsfeld, but he actually did make a fairly intelligent comment on that one point. Um, it pains me to say that, oh my God. So here's where it's gonna get interesting. Let's select the supplier ID and the part ID from suppliers and parts where the part city not equal to the supplier city, remember, you can't compare nulls, or the part city not equal to Paris, you can't compare nulls. What is that going to return? <laughs> Thank you, Marine. So let's walk through this. We get no rows because we can't compare null city. The comparisons don't work, therefore the where clause is always going to be false. We know that. But the unknown city, it is either Paris or it is not Paris. Are we agreed this is a Boolean? That part is in Paris or it is not. Does that make sense so far? We're going to walk through this slowly because this is where people get hurt. If it is Paris, the first condition is true. Because we know that the supplier city is London, therefore the part city is not London, therefore, because this is an or, the where clause has to evaluate as true, and we do get part P1. What if the part is not in Paris? If it's not in Paris, the second condition must be true. Therefore, the entire where clause, because we have an or, must evaluate as true, and therefore we must get P1 regardless of where that part is. So because we can't compare nulls, we have an SQL statement that cannot return any data, but in reality, it has to return that part logically. I'm gonna ask, I, I should ask at this point, does this make sense? But I know a few people, their brains are kind of melting. If you think this is spurious, I spent an entire day working on an 80-line SQL statement which had this exact same logic flaw because we had a particular join condition, a left join, that was returning some null values. This happens in the real world, and it's impossible to avoid when you get outer joins, because, or if you deliberately include null data in your database, and your database will lie to you. The more you use nulls, the more your database will lie. Do not use null columns if you can possibly avoid it. By the way, I'm not religious about this. You will find times that I will use null columns in my database. Very, very, very seldom, and I think about it very hard before I do that. So, I don't know how much time we have left, but uh, do we have any questions? Yes? Okay, actually, I'll use the uh, employee example better, the salary, because that one's a little bit clearer. People will understand this a little bit more. Here, so let's just take the simple case where you have, they don't have a salary because they're an hourly employee. So you might have a salary table, and you might have an hourly table. And in fact, the hourly rate could apply to a contractor. 
So you can have multiple things linking out to hourly rate. So if you have something which is a null value, it means the existence of that value or its non-existence or whatever's going on isn't completely dependent on the key. So quite often that means that value belongs in another table. And instead of having a null value, you simply have the existence or non-existence of a row. Does that make sense? So then you can join across. If you need to have those null values, you can do an outer join against it. If you do not want those null values, you do a straight join against it. And you don't have to worry about any tricky work comparing nulls, and it makes it simpler. Yeah, at that point, you've basically made a one to maybe one relation. Uh, yes. Um, and there's more work you can do at the database level to actually enforce that. You know, I've done stuff with... Uh, uh, creating triggers and things like that to validate some really tricky parts of the logic because I like to push the logic into the database as much as possible. Um, and again, this is not perfect, what I'm describing, but it will be much, much better than most databases out there. Any other questions? Yes? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, that's something uh, well beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. That's the sort of thing where you have code reviews, you have gatekeepers, you try and find out what they're actually doing, why they're trying to do it, how the database rules apply, or how the business rules apply, because you can have the exact same set of data for two different databases, and they can be normalized in completely different ways, depending upon what the business rules are. Like, if an address doesn't require a customer, you might have an address table, which doesn't necessarily link back to a customer. If an address requires a customer, again, customer address, you still have the same data, but it's structured differently. That's, it's too generic of a question to answer on how you're going to maintain that. You have to have people who are vigilant and paying attention to this. This is why DBAs are a good idea, particularly DBAs who actually understand database normalization, because at this point, they can call you on this and say, hold on, this is a bad idea, and this is why. Five minutes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I'll get to you. Yes? Um, it depends upon the naming strategy that you decide to adopt. Uh, like the examples that I used on foreign keys, which were back there quite a way, I didn't name them, and the database was going to name them for me. Uh, well, it's, it's there somewhere, I promise you. I, I seem to remember having that. Ah, yes. So here, I have two different uh, foreign keys. I didn't name them. The database is going to name, name them for me, depending upon what its rules are. And then you can expect... Uh, well, well, the database version of the meta object protocol, their information schema in order to pull out this, or you just adopt a naming convention like FK underscore and then concatenate the field. Sometimes that's frustrating because there are links on the names. Uh, naming conventions on that, it's good if they're consistent so that they could be predictable. But uh, yeah, that's, again, that's something possibly a little bit more beyond that, more beyond what I'm trying to talk about here. So you can ask me afterwards. I could just start brainstorming ideas for you if you want. Uh, Peter, I'm going to hate your question, but go ahead. <laughs> That's a comment. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, the very best interface I have ever seen for that in my life was written by a company back in Portland, Oregon, where they had what they called data sets, and they had a huge amount of internal logic, which was hidden behind the scenes. In the data set, you could simply say, uh, let me get a, do I have a joint example here? Oh, well, I won't worry about that. So, uh, where they would say, you know, Give me customers whose orders total more than you know a thousand euro in the last month and group them by country, and it would give you that. 
And behind the scenes, it would do a huge amount of work to figure out which tables everything belonged to, how to look them up, how to do all the group by, uh, and just it would handle all of that for you. And it was the best way I've ever seen of doing that. But um, this is the case where our technology is simply too primitive. Uh, databases suck hard, but they're kind of the best we have right now. No SQL, by the way, is a steaming pile of <clears throat> usually, <laughs> not always. Um, I, I would not always say that. The word like always and never, very dangerous. So that's, that's really hard to say. They're tough to work with, but you need to have the data integrity there as a general rule. So as a result, um, yeah, it's just something we have to suffer with. Uh, no, I, I can't answer that as a generic case because it really depends. Are you going to have a lot of dynamic generated on the fly queries? Or are you going to have a simple set of static queries that are always going to be run? Um, you know, in the latter case, writing it by hand is great. You can fine tune it, you can do a lot of work, a lot of dynamic queries getting changed all the time. Maybe a library is better. I, I can't give a simple answer to that question. Sorry. Hold on, was there, I think there was someone over here who had their hand up? Okay, no, Moran? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't they use like empty strings for that? Um, I actually like doing that. I do that quite a bit on the game Veer that I've been writing. Uh, I also like tools like PGTap and MyTap, which allow you to write things very similar to Perl tests, but in, write them in, you know, directly in SQL, which is embedded in like, I use Skitch now for a lot of my database management, so it automatically runs tests for you when you do the migrations. Um, and that's the case where if you wind up with problems like that, you write a test to figure out how to deal with it in the future. Uh, you know, maybe you've got some clever triggers, hopefully not, but sometimes you need them in order to correct for issues like that. It's, again, that's just a generic thing, hard to say, but for me, I'm kind of a testing advocate, as I think most folks know. One minute. I think we have time for one more question. Yes? Um, do you have a view on using stored procedures for business objects? So maybe in the base case, there should be in your domain model. Oh. Uh, should you put your business logic, or some of your business logic, as a stored procedure within your database, or should you put it in your domain model? I really like the idea of using stored procedures in the database for ensuring that you cannot subvert the intention of the database. So many years ago, I think like you, you can still see it as late as like 2000, 2001, MySQL still had a brilliant <clears throat> essay on their website about why foreign keys in the database are a bad idea. And <laughs> They listed all these reasons why, you know, all foreign keys slow things down, they make it harder to write queries, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is, if you don't put it in your database, it's easy for someone to subvert that logic. So the question becomes at this point, is it appropriate for the logic and the stored procedure to be subverted? So if you have people writing stuff at the code level, particularly if you have multiple applications hitting the same database, that's where you want to push that logic down in the database as much as possible in order to make sure that some person who is unaware of the business logic doesn't write something to get around it by accident. So I like that. Uh, many ORMs do not support that, and then you have to do tricks in order to get around that, unfortunately. Uh, so I think that was it on time. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.